first item of business is the nomination of a chair. Any nomination? Uh, yeah, I, I, well, can I just say, first of all, um, just to report to the committee that um, Frank, Frank Field MP has um, uh, sort of indicated to me that due to his parliamentary duties, he, he no longer wishes to uh, serve as chair of this constituency committee. Thanks everybody for the um, help and support um, over the last few years where he's been chair, but uh, he has indicated he no longer wishes to, um, uh, to, to serve on the committee. So in, 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 as a result of that, I'd like to nominate um, Councillor George Davis as, as chair of the constituency committee for the forthcoming municipal year. Any second? Start off with then. Uh, we've got three presentations for you this evening uh, to start the. Um, and the first presentation will be by the Wirral Area Commander, uh, Ian Hassel, who is new to the Wirral. Would you like to address the committee? Thank you. behaviour and the partnership work that we're involved 
antisocial behaviour and uh, across the piece there is a downward trend uh, around antisocial behaviour but that's notwithstanding that obviously um, people particularly who are repeat victims obviously um, can have a you know, significant impact on individuals' lives and obviously in relation to the seven beats area within the constituency it just shows the proportion in relation to the, to the uh, total uh, number of reported crimes there but as you can see in both areas there is a, a downward trend of antisocial behaviour reported to the police. This next slide is just the overall performance for um, this particular policing area, which we call uh, Alpha 3. Um, when you look at that, obviously, you, you know, it raises questions, what's, what's going on? But it is very seasonal antisocial behaviour, and the peaks are obviously as we're heading towards the, the summer periods. Um, and actually, if you take a positive from this slide in particular, you can see in the June there, it's actually plateaued within this, this, in this area. It's not as significant as it has been um, in the previous uh, 12 months. <coughs> Overlaying it with crime, again, it's a similar, it's a similar picture really. And what we've, we've seen with regards to um, our crime in particular, like any organisation, you know, we're under a lot of scrutiny. And Her Majesty's Inspector Constabulary come in and they look at the way you record crime and deal with crime. And um, this is um, the same for all the forces in England and Wales. All forces are becoming far smarter around what they actually, what they actually record as crime. And uh, from an integrity perspective, the actual conversion rate from a person complaining about something and it becomes, becoming a crime is quite significant now. So for violence, we, we're around 90% of violence incidents get, get actually recorded as crimes. Now some of those may not have identifiable victims on, so it just goes to show that, that there's obviously stories within the figures uh, when you've actually got um, a volume reported because a CCTV operator may see an incident taking place and they can see someone's been assaulted, so we need to report that as, as a crime, but we might not actually know who the individuals necessarily are involved, whereas historically those sort of things wouldn't get reported. So from, you know, from a, a reporting point of view, um, we feel we can accurately say now and use the figures obviously to work out where our hotspots of, uh, of crime are um, and we place the resources there of course that we've got an accurate picture now and, and certainly if you go back sort of four or five years the percentage conversion rates were less than 50% of the <laughs> so it does sort of demonstrate the types of figures that we use in our days. And that's again just a, a, a map really sort of tracking What we find, uh, and a lot of forces in England and Wales are really having a good look now at what we might call cyber-enabled crime, because there's a lot of crime taking place via social media in particular. You know, it's really prevalent with some of our members of Parliament, of course, and it's, it's obviously in the media quite a lot. And certainly within the Wirral area, both uh, this constituency area and Wallasey in general, and it is where there's a lot of high footfall, so we're still trying to understand what that means. But we do get a lot of um, crimes and incidents reported which are via Facebook, via a variety of social media platforms. And they form the greatest proportion of, of, of our violence uh, reported crimes. So a lot of them are, are um, people using language which is causing harassment, alarm, distress to people. And they're recorded within our violence figures. So it's not. I mean, obviously, for a victim of, of that, you know, particularly if for some reason they don't know who the, per the, per the perpetrator is, that, that could be significant. But some, somewhere in the region of 80% of our violence crimes are the victim knows the perpetrator. So um, it's just a little bit of context, really, on, on the figures. So, what, what are we doing uh, locally as the police? Well, obviously, um, we're working very closely with the local authority and looking at how we target our social behaviour. Um, as I said, there's a lot of work going on with regards to the actual uh, mapping of what we term volume crime. So you sort of shoplifting type offences, your vehicle crime type offences. Um, and obviously we're looking at, at organised crime. So there's a lot of work goes on with our partners, you know, and it, and it affects all areas of the country, including the world. We've also got a significant 
four, uh, 12 keys, uh, you know, and so we regularly run operations around human trafficking, we regularly run operations around the likes of fast food establishments and, and those types of premises um, to see whether we've got um, people here who, who shouldn't be here in the country or who are victims of trafficking into the country and now uh, working obviously for the um, scoopers, paymasters, you know, at reduced rates. So we're very much involved in that quite regularly. We're involved uh, with the COLA. We've co-located already the, the World on Social Behaviour Team at Waterford Police Station. And we see this as a great opportunity with the change in the legislation around our social behaviour. There's a lot of work going on around uh, closure notices, closure orders, around targets in particular, houses within particular areas. And you know, we can cite a number of examples within this constituency. But we've got to be smart about it as well because that is obviously a robust enforcement approach. And invariably, if we close a particular property, it, it may displace the problem to somewhere else. It's a short-term measure, but it might be the short-term measure that's required to get all the agencies in to obviously look at how we can maybe improve the quality of life for, for uh, people who are suffering antisocial behaviour in particular or other types of criminality in the area. We've brought uh, a detective constable over to work with our priority team who's come from uh, a partnership unit over at headquarters and they've got really good links in with the likes of uh, revenue and customs, um, trading standards, a, a variety of agencies so that we can information share effectively um, but we can also work with them because sometimes we might not have the powers to get through the door because we, we have to stand in front of a magistrate and obviously get warrants sworn out but actually the fire service can go and check on fire regulations you know there's a lot of different agencies that have a lot of different powers but as long as we work together we can obviously pull our, our resource and that's really working well and obviously there's a number of particular agencies we work and you'll see operations running outside the tunnels, you'll see operations uh, around particular properties in particular beat areas, you know, the way um, when we're working around sort of safer neighbourhoods and that sort of development, this is just an ongoing extension of that work and regularly goes on within the seven beats area. So here's just a couple of examples and what I would say about problem solving and, and some of the issues that are raised, um, you cannot always say you're going to eradicate the Problem. You know, these, some of these are really long-term uh, approaches of which uh, you know, the police and other partners have a role to play at different uh, points on the continuum of that sort of change programme. So I'm sure people will be familiar with some of the issues around um, the antisocial behaviour being caused around street drinking around Birkenhead. And there's obviously, without reading directly off the slide, there's obviously a number of initiatives uh, underway um, where we'll look at the likes of the controlled drinking environments. We're looking um, at targeting individuals that are not really, <coughs> really, and that's the key. The key is use the enforcement approach to those that aren't working you know, within, within our um, acceptable behaviour sort of criteria. And there's a lot of work going on with businesses as well, and, and this has been really good, um, where obviously, particularly sort of around Hamilton Square area, Obviously, there's been an identification of a number of licensed premises selling cheap, strong beers, ciders, and there's been agreement with the businesses around um, obviously not stocking those um, th those types of um, products. Um, but what's really good that's come out of it is a lot of information sharing and you know, the actual just getting through the door and speaking to the businesses, and find, you know, because they, they know what's going on within their own business environment and. We're very much getting good bits of intelligence to help us look towards targeting well, who is selling to underage um, you know, uh, people, who is selling to uh, street drinkers, and who is still stopping um, these types of um, uh, products. Another area is on the Beachwood Estate, and, and obviously there's a myriad of, uh, of uh, partnership work that is taking place that uh, looks towards trying to make the environment a better place to be. You know, whether we're working locally with the street scene, whether we're working with outreach workers, um, obviously we've, you know, we've spoken about skip, skip days, um, we've spoken with Joe about skip days and cleaning up the area and making it better.
mentioned elements within here, but obviously we need the community to work with us um, and the other partners. And, and you know, we are just one of the stakeholders in that particular area. Here's just a list of some of the collaborative events that um, police have been involved with and you know, taking place within the constituency. We've had some really positive uh, feedback um, around some of the activity, uh, um, particularly around, uh, I think, the, uh, Mr. Bobby, I think he was in the picture on the right hand side there. Um, and, and obviously, it, it's a constantly changing picture of social media, particularly around the, the town centre and particularly around some of the, the safer spaces and identifying the groups that are, I like say, using the word operating, just police jargon, but really are, are in that environment that may be a cause of some social behaviour. And, you know, I see. Our role from a, a local policing perspective is to make sure that we've got that level of engagement, but also with the partners. <laughs> Sometimes people see the uniform or speak to us, but there are other partners they will speak to. And we get an understanding of what the requirements are, and then we can have a bit of a develop a problem solving approach. So, what's going on with Merseyside Police at the moment? Well, there's a 10 year estate strategy that the Police and Crime Commissioner. Sometime, I think it was early last year, not the year back in the year before. And uh, a number of the old, um, dare I say, decrepit buildings that um, were police stations have been closed down. Some of them, in fact, the Wirral is at the forefront for the force, really. Um, four of the old uh, police buildings have been sold off now and are actually going to be used, I think, I think for things like the nurseries and, and the likes. Um, but we're tending to move into more community access points that, that we're community police stations and um, a picture of them and, and the locations of them um, on the next slide the, 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 obviously there's, there's one um, down in Rock Ferry not far from well where Well Lane Police Station was um, there is uh, one just off Laird Street we've got uh, one opened up in Hoyley cur currently and there's another one in Morton and across the world as a whole there's a number of other sites that have been identified <coughs> and moved towards our, our community policing model which obviously our, our new chief Constable, um, Chief Constable Andy Cook is, is driving at the moment. Uh, and what we're looking for really is A, to be close to other partners so that we can share information, talk, and we, we know who are the right people to actually um, speak to rather than just being an enforcement issue all the time. But actually, we're looking for the footfall because the old police stations, the, foot, the, the number of people actually attending the old police stations has been dramatically going downhill. And even though we will canvass people, we will say what you want and they'll say oh, I'm a police officer on the corner of the street and I want um, a police station to go to. The figures <coughs> for particular police stations don't demonstrate that. We moved to the yellow telephones and now we're looking for drop-in surgeries where we can advertise quite regularly. We will ensure police officers are here between certain hours each week. So if you want a face-to-face -face meeting you can do. Obviously, um, we're working with uh, Birkin at first. We've had a, a, a meeting with uh, members of the, the BID. Um, and obviously, we're looking to develop that relationship uh, as it moves forward. Uh, we're aware of the development of a hive and uh, obviously keen to be involved in any, any way we can. And f from our point of view, uh, th there's a transition between now and, and uh, January next year where the manner in which Merseyside Police is actually structured, is going to change. But what we're actually hoping to do, or what we are doing, is we're ensuring for years and years, and I've got 25 years in the police service, the shift pattern has changed once in that time. And we've become far smarter than that. <coughs> so we went up, and it doesn't go, you know, it's no surprise, it's, I think the peak time is 8 o'clock on a Friday night. But, but it, it, it's no surprise, as we move towards the weekend, the peak time for, for 999 calls, is obviously your early in the evening into the early hours of the morning. And yet we have stuck for years with the same number of people on shifts at any one time. And there's regular times where demand is outstripping the supply of police officers. To, even though we've, we've maximised the number of police officers on duty, we, we've had to get resources over from Liverpool to, to come and support us. And with the new model, what we're looking to do is we're looking to make sure we've got the right numbers of staff on at the right time. So 
we have to also have a building process. <coughs> that includes changing the shift pattern for all the staff. So there's different elements of policing. We're still going to have a response elements, which are going to answer your 999 calls and your priority calls. We're still going to have a CID within the investigation elements, um, and we're going to have a local policing element, which is currently in enabled policing. And that local policing element are going to have the staff on during the days involved in the partnership work. Um, <coughs> I'll mention the community police stations, and this is just for the locations of the ones on this side of the road. There are others that are going to um, pop up um, uh, as we develop them. Um, Hoylake and Morton, uh, Laird Street, currently, uh, <coughs> that's Birmingham Police Station itself, and then obviously um, down towards uh, the one that's off the uh, Oldchester Road there. This is where the architectural types of buildings that they're in. Obviously, you've got the, uh, the one the one stop store in the uh, pyramids. But these are the buildings that, that uh, they're in, and we're very much looking to advertise um, our availability uh, at a local level for people who have got issues that aren't emergency issues, so that the local policing teams can get involved. And if we're not the right agency to deal with the issue, that we can make sure that we have that partnership working with the right agency. To so a bit of a whistle stop so on. I don't know if there's any questions off anybody at all. Right. Yeah, thank you.
certainly the start of it, probably just in the first week. Um, you know, could you say something about how you how you're targeting things? Well, well, our community well, patrol have been, you know, advising us that they've been very busy with all of these things as well. I mean, from, well, you, I mean, I think they have part of their perspective, obviously, it's about sort of sharing information, making sure that it's hard to analyze areas through community patrols, through our own local police and resources, from from a, a prevention perspective. We've got schools officers that don't break up with the schools that obviously work with youth groups uh, you know to make sure that we're trying to identify people who are responsible we've got cid from an investigative point of view obviously looking at what forensic cctv opportunities there are to actually identify offenders in relation to that so if, you know at a local level and once once we've identified somewhere well clearly there's a requirement around targets harming around well, why is why is it being able to happen in the first place you know it might not just be um some minor act of vandalism it might be targeting a particular you know um, victims um, for, for what one reason or other we look at you know how we can target harm around sort of like sort of fire safety fire bags that type of that type of equipment so we do very much share the data we've got analysts that work with the local partnership and look at look at the um, overlay of the offences <coughs> and the hotspot issues and we bring those things to, they come to our operational meeting every week and we obviously discuss what activity each of the agencies can put in place and if there isn't an agency there that represented we obviously feed in through our partnership working to, to make sure that we can get you know, uh, some activity driven from us. Okay, anybody else? I'm not a stage performer, but uh, we have to, the mic's yeah. not working, unfortunately, so would have had it otherwise. Okay. Yes.
to do. Every single one, every single RSL has an antisocial behaviour officers that they pay for. And therefore, I just personally believe that if something happened, and we'll just use the beach with the state as a great example, the RSL that operates on that estate will only look after the people who pay them rent. Now, every estate in the whole world is now more than 50% private compared to what it was before. So therefore, I honestly believe the collaborative approach to make sure that crime is cut down is when we get everybody all working for the same people. And I think what Ian just basically said, when they get the hotspots delivered to them on a Monday morning, they know exactly where they can put their resource. And I think it's one we need to follow even further than what we're going to do on this. Okay. So um, I'll move. If that's, thank you very much for being here. We bought it. Very See as well on that, but to the east it goes to 
So it's quite a big geographical area, and it's different than most bits that you'll see up and down the country. Uh, if you look at Liverpool as an example, Liverpool has two business improvement districts, one for the retail and one for the commercial. Uh, so they have one around the Liverpool one area and one around um, the area which includes all Hall Street, places like that. We decided that we'd have one bit, uh, or both one bit, and this covers retail, industrial and commercial. So it's quite different in terms of the mix of, um, of businesses within that uh, geographical area. Um,
those 6,000 people who came in during the local winter non event on and sit in the bar and have a, uh, have a picnic or just stroll through on their way through to the, um, through the shops. What was also great about it, and again, Ian alluded to, was the partnership where the police were great, the council were great. Uh, Mersey Rail gave free travel to anybody coming, so if they showed that they were coming to the B and Mersey Head Festival, no matter where they were coming from, they got a free rail pass for them to buy people. Uh, so, you know, it was a real group of public sector and private sector partners putting together and I said we will have more of those, but I think the first one uh, on Tuesday was a great success. I'm just doing some final evaluation, but they worked really well. Um, the other time, those who probably see more of now, very visible in their red jackets with big head first on the back of it. Um, and I think uh, they're enthusiastic. So what are we doing in this document? Uh, we say if we had a yes vote, we'd have four hundred and thirteen thousand pounds a year for five years. The big last for five years. At the end of five years, there needs to be another vote by all businesses that pay the money. We put in this uh, <coughs> that we address through the consultation we did uh, for what these businesses wanted, and we put an amount to each of them, an annual amount. <coughs> Um, so business support, um, there are a number of businesses in, uh, in Birkenhead, particularly in the town centre, who aren't eligible for any government funded business support because they deliver business to customers, not business to business. And business to customers and shops, retail, is not eligible for support through the, uh, the funds that the UK government or indeed the EU make available. We've been able to support those businesses in terms of how uh, they get more customers in, working on a business plan, looking at some of the some of their marketing and uh, their social media activities. Also, we've run free training courses for them, so we've, run, we've got a training course running uh, tomorrow uh, on excellence in customer service. Uh, so that's all free to the, the biz, uh, sorry, the, the bid uh, levy place. The town host, as I said, 